to the team here this morning. I was moving to ask you to sing the chorus that we don't usually sing on a Sunday morning, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We were all wretch and we were lost. And if we're anything today, it all has to do with, has nothing to do with church, has nothing to do with religion, it has everything to do with Jesus. And that's why we bless him this morning.
But uh, there's some people that have not had a piece of cake. There's people that are that have succumbed it. There's people that are in the hospital. Uh, there's people, how many of you in here have had it? I hope you weren't here while you had it. <laughs> let, let me do this. How many? Those of you that have had it, stand. The ones that are sitting down are in denial. You can be seated up just here. I'll give you a test up and test. Oh Lord, I didn't realize that the front row. If you've noticed that the front row is a little different, <laughs> it looks like somebody ate half of it. It's because of the it's because of the camera, and so Pastor John said this morning <laughs> we moved the seats because we were. We were, we were recording the necks of people that sit there. And, uh, and he said last time, I don't know what he said, last time we weren't able to see. I said, well, then move them quickly. <laughs> want to be seen. Anyway, I want you to know that God is a good God. For those of you that are visiting with us for the first, second, third time, um, I don't want to imply in any way, shape, or form that we're a better church than anybody else. We're different. We're, it's not churchy, it's a family. We're a family. When one cries, we cry together. And when one laughs and one rejoices and celebrates, we want to celebrate with you as well. Uh, there's times that we're singing with our hands up, and there's times that we sing with our hands in our pockets, and there's times that we sing with our faces looking up, and sometimes we put our faces down, and you can, all you can see is the tears as they fall on the floor. You know why? Because when we get here, we're so thankful. I'm speaking for myself this morning. I'm thankful to the Lord because He's been so good. You see, God is not... God, God is holy. Yes, yes. God is holy. But God is not somebody that is way out there. The Holy Spirit is in the room. And for the, Holy, for the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. And every so often we change things. On the 13th of, of, of February, which is what? Next Tuesday? A day after tomorrow is already February. On the 13th, we invite you to come. Some of you know and some, some of you don't know what we're going to do, but some of you do know. And those of you who don't know, just come. And let me just tell you that it's going to be a day of fasting. Okay, so don't eat breakfast at home. All right, we promise that you won't, you won't pass out here. We'll give you some water and, and, and <laughs> water and day bread. I'm just joking, I'm just joking. But uh, we, we want you to come and rejoice. We're going to have a day of family uh, in the morning service. We're not going to have the Spanish service in the evening. We're going to get together and have a, a celebration of, of a, a family. If you guys get together at home, uh, you know, for this year, don't get together at home. Come and get together here with us. You'll enjoy it. We're going to we'll watch the Super Bowl here. We'll have a great time in the Lord together. Uh, it's not churchy again, but but we, everything that we do, we do it as unto the Lord. Amen. All right. Uh, have we picked up our tithe and our offering yet? No. no? Y'all have a fast song. Or we're going to pick up our tithe and our offering. Those of you that are visiting with us this morning, this is not for you. You don't have to feel obligated to to take out some money and put it in the bucket. This is for the church because this is our responsibility. And then after that, we have a baby dedication, and then we're going to get ready for the word.
to where we'd be willing to have you bring him up. Are you aware of that responsibility? You don't want to check it out? All right. And then we have the rest of the, the rest of the clan. And you are who? I'm sorry? Layla, Nevea, and Lily. And they're what? How are they? Our oh, they're your daughters. All right. You're pretty. How old are you? Boyfriend? Married? Don't know that? <laughs> What's your name? Zayden. Zayden, how old are you? 11. Oh, he's a big brother. All right, good looking. Good looking big brother, huh? Any young girls in the house? Don't look over here. Are you? I'm asking him if he's taking applications from young girls, but that's it. Not yet. Tell him not yet. Oh, defensive. I'm gonna hold on a second. Yeah, I'm sure this one has some applications already, huh? Yeah? You see, Jesus, when he was eight days old, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple. And they, they presented him to God. In the, in the custom of the law or the Jews, they would take the child twice. Eight days and 40 days. And we don't, we don't do that any longer. We just we, we, we present our children to God because we recognize that they're a gift. They are a gift from God. And I, I say this all the time, especially for girls, but for boys too. He's going to go to kindergarten, and he's going to go to preschool, and he's going to go to first grade, and he's going to go there and that and the other, and he's going to look at a little, what's her name? Lily. Of course, she's going to be older than him, but there will be other Lilies. And he's going to look at little Lily, and little Lily's not going to look at him. He's going to like her. He's going to chase her. He's going to pull her hair and trip her. Steal her candy and probably hit her on the back of the head. That's just a boy's way of getting the attention. Ladies, listen, when a guy hits you in the back of the head, if you're married, hit him back. If you're single, look and see if you like, and if you like, well, say not now. Uh, but anyway, and he's going to come running to you, and he's going to tell you, Mommy, Lily didn't like me. And you're going to have to comfort him. And Andy, you're going to have, you're his hero. You have to be his hero because, and I'm not talking about another man, right? I'm talking about the fact that the enemy, the enemy will always present a predator. And so we need to be careful with this kids, with all of them. You need to be a guardian to these children like a hawk, like never before, because today more than ever, we're living in a sick society. And we need to be very careful. And so today, um, Andy and Valerie are bringing their child, Andres, together with Rudy and Kendra. And they're bringing, they also brought their, their children to be witnesses to this. Hold this. Look at this good-looking boy. He can come closer so he won't think I'm taking him away. Would you stand with me? Oh, you're trying to get him closer. Okay. You know him, I don't. I want you to symbolically um, stretch your hand out as if we were praying together for him. We bring him as unto the Lord and we dedicate him this morning. Father, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I hold in my hands, oh God, or in my arms, a gift. A gift by the name of Andres. And Father, we present him to you this morning as his parents, his witnesses, and their children come. Lord God, to present him as a gift, a gift from you. And this morning, Lord Jesus, we do as your parents did when they took Jesus. They took you to the temple. And Lord God, this morning we want to thank you. We want to bless you. We want to worship you. Lord God, we 
ask that you lay your hand of protection over Andres' body. That you lay your hand, O oh God, over him. That you keep him, O oh Lord, from childhood diseases. That you keep him from, from anything that would be harmful to him. Lord God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, a minister, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I, I dedicate him to you right now, Lord God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we bless you, we honor you, and we worship you. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ. We will be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Why don't we do the? We have a PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Oh, Ella has a song. Oh, the, the one, the one I taught her. Yes, yeah, you may be seated. As Pastor said, all the bad parts are for him, and the good parts are for God. Since he taught me. Um, this song is a very, very old song that I used to sing when I was much younger. Um, coach used to ask me to sing it, and I haven't seen it very often. But um, he used to tell me, sing this song Sunday. It's got this, such a powerful message. I can't believe that, you know, how strong of a message it is. And um, I regret that I didn't sing it more, but... Um, we didn't have much of a chance to practice it, so we're going to give it a shot. But the words itself are very powerful. He was right in saying that it was very powerful. And, you know, the loss of, of Coach was very hurtful. But just know that this song was what he always wanted me to sing to pass the message on to you all. So he still is telling us through this song um, the message that he always did, you know, when he was alive. And we miss him so much, but we, I want to dedicate the song to him this morning. Jesus said, here I stand, won't you please let me in? And you said, I will, tomorrow. Jesus said,
message is tearing down idols in our lives. Again, tearing down idols in our lives. How many of us know what an idol truly is? Anyone? Who knows what an idol is? Something you put before God. Your time, your energy, commitment, whatever it is. Could be your job, could be boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, so many different things. Could be our shows, our cell phone, anything that takes the place of God in our lives is an idol. And God says that He is a jealous God, that we should have no other gods before Him. But we do it all the time. And today, we're going to be talking about an idol. And this idol was in the form of a bull. It was in the form of a bull, God, little g. And today, like in the Word of God, like in the time of Elijah, we're going to cut that bull. Now don't look at me like that. I saw some of the eyes. Oh my gosh, she's cussing the church. Not cussing the church. Everybody say, cut the bull. Come on, say, cut the bull. <laughs> some of you are still looking at me cross-eyed. It's okay. <laughs> Listen. This is a biblical thing, and I'm going to show you and prove it to you through the Word of God. When we say, now, in our modern day vernacular, in society, when we say cut the bull, that means stop lying. That means tell the truth. Does it not? So that's exactly what we're going to be focusing on here this morning. We've come to an age where everything is accepted, but also on the flip side of it, when it comes to the things of God, it's not accepted. Right. You see, we do not stand up for the things of God the way we need to. We have become comfortable and we've let the pagan ways of this world come in slowly and take the place of God in our lives. This morning, we have to cut that bull. Can you hear an amen? amen? What am I saying? We have to kill and let the idols of our lives fall down before Jesus Christ. Every single one of us. You might be saying, Pastor John, I don't have an idol. If that's the truth, if that's the truth, listen to me, then we need to make sure with everything inside us that everything that we do honors God. And it doesn't take the place of God. Time, energy, efforts, job, people. No idols in our lives. 
Why? Because we serve the one true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. Can we give him a hand of praise this morning? You see, we might be able to fool the whole world, but we will never be able to fool God. Because God is a holy God. And he wants people that are not afraid to stand up for him to tell others that they love him. Do you love him this morning? Church, I said, do you love him this morning? See, he took a stand for you, and he took a stand for me. We need to stop playing games with God and love him the way that he deserves to be loved. You see, we cannot be so comfortable in our complacent state that we don't even realize that we have fallen away from God and stop serving Him altogether. And that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about this morning. And if you have your Bibles, tablets, cell phones, if you want to read it on the screen, turn me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And we'll be reading out of the NIV this morning. So to give you a quick background as you're looking for that, I want to tell you what's going on in the scripture. It's about King Ahab and about the people of Israel and how they became complacent for the things of God. They were seduced into Baal worship. Baal was a god of fertility. And it's funny because Baal was also in the form of a bull. Now this Baal worship was led by none other than Queen Jezebel. And we start our story today when there was a great drought in the land because of Ahab and Israel's disobedience. Because no one else stood up for God. God had to send an outsider. Can you imagine that church? That if us as Victory Faith Church did not take a stand for God, God would have to send an outsider in here to say, hey, it's time to get your act together. It's time to serve the one true God. Do we serve the one true God with our actions? Do we serve the one true God with what we say, what we listen to, what we watch? Do we serve the one true God? Or is it, has it become Baal worship? Just meaningless things. It's just things done in vain repetition. Oh, I come to church because that's the thing to do. I come to church because, hey, my mom and my dad came to church. I come to church because my grandma and grandpa, I want those excuses can go on and on and on. But do you serve the one true God today? Do you love Him? Do you have that relationship with Him? Please, I need you to get this with me this morning. You have to get it. That this was the Israelites. And God had to get Elijah to come back and say, look, you have not been serving me. You've not been worshiping me. You're worshiping all these false gods. Where am I in that? Where is God in your life, church? Does he take priority? Does he? Today's going to be one that we examine our own hearts, our own lives. Our actions, the things we do. Again, tomorrow is not promised to us. And yet, like the song that just blessed me, we all did it. We live our lives like tomorrow is promised to us, and it's not. The Bible says that we are like a vapor in the wind. We are here today, and we're gone tomorrow. We need to make every second count for the glory of God. God help us. If he ever has to send an outsider like he did with Elijah. So let's go to verse 17 through 19 of the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18. And it says, and this is amazing, this is funny. When he saw Elijah the prophet, his prophet, God's prophet, Ahab said to him, Is that you, the one who makes trouble in Israel? Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he says, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon, this is what had to happen. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring, look at this, look what already happened. 
the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Look at that. They had all of these prophets and they were serving an idol. They were worshiping an idol. 450. 400. 450 for Baal, 450 for Asherah, and all being led by his evil wife Jezebel. It's a horrible thing. And you know that there's something wrong when the Christians start getting blamed for bad things happening to bad people. Can you hear an amen? It's amazing and it's shocking at the same time when we can walk into a public school and they say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You cannot pray. You cannot bring your Bible. Hey, those Ten Commandments on those walls, we need to get rid of them because they're offensive. But then you see kids today and they're there they are with their shirts, with 666 and pentagrams and all these different demonic things all over them. Do they tell them anything? No, they don't. But us as ministers have to get special permission to even go into a public school and minister to these kids about Jesus Christ. We have a problem, church. I said we have a problem. And if we don't take a stand, if you don't take a stand, if I don't take a stand, then who will? And what starts to happen is that we get desensitized. What starts to happen is that we just go with the flow. What starts to happen is that we accept everything as normal, the way that society is. And hey, that's normal. And that's the way it should look like. And hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer in Christ, I'm going to start to go with the flow. Go with the status quo to where you can't even tell the believer apart from the non-believer. And God help us, church. I said, God help us, church. It's tough. This is a hard message to swallow. But we made too many idols. We have too many bulls out there that we worship on a daily basis. You might be saying, no, 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 Pastor, that's not me. I hope it's not. But it's amazing, church that we just take a stand for everything else instead of God. And God help us. We make so many excuses. And I think Adam in the garden was the one that took the cake on this. He's the one that said, hey, wait a minute, God. Don't blame me. Blame the wife that you gave me. How many still blame the wife? Raise your hand. <laughs> he says he knocked his wife over there. <laughs> she can't pitch him or throw him a dirty look. It's the blame game. It's the husband you gave me. It's the wife you gave me. It's the kids. Wait a minute, you made those kids. Stop complaining about it. <laughs> Church, do we have excuses? I said, do we have excuses? Yes. We do. We have excuses for everything. Of why we don't come to church. Of why we don't serve God. Of why we don't read our Bibles. Wait a minute, Pastor John. There's 24 hours in a day. That's just too little time to open up my word and give God 10 minutes. Everybody say, ouch. Come on, say, ouch. Imagine that. Can't even give God 10 minutes of your day. Do you see how things can change? Do you see how quickly going from having an awesome relationship with God and loving God and serving God and seeing the miracles of God happen in your life and all of a sudden you just start to get complacent and complacent and complacent to where all of a sudden something else is on that altar. Something else is getting worshipped on the altar of our hearts. And God help us. God help us from time to time. He needs to clean the house, spiritual house in us. That we need to examine our lives and examine our hearts at God. Have I allowed anything else in my life to take priority over you? And if it's a yes, it's time to cut that bull. It's time to sacrifice that bull and get back to where you need to be with God this morning, church. You see, God is coming back for a church that is without spot or blemish. Will that be us? Will that be you? Will that be me? 
Going back to our story, Ahab was not man enough to own up and say, Elijah, look, I messed up. I allowed my evil wife to bring all of her false gods in and now we're worshiping him. Instead of the one true God, now we're worshiping Baal and Asherah. He didn't own up to it. But he blamed Elijah. And he called Elijah the troubler. You're the one, Elijah. I know you're sent from God, but still you're the one that's making trouble for me. Instead of owning up to his own actions. With me this morning, church, say this. It's time. Say it's time. To let the idols fall. Come on, church, you got to get this. Say it's time. To let the idols fall. Say it's time to cut the bull. In verse 19, it says this. Again, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Elijah was calling for a showdown between our God and the non-existent false God. All of Israel, all of it, was going to observe the contest between Elijah and the prophets who cared and protected these crazy false things by Jezebel. They went up on Mount Carmel, the place where they worshiped their gods. And this was the ideal place for this contest to take place. So let's go to verse 20. And it says, they have sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel where they worshiped. Elijah went before the people and said, how long? Now he gets up there, he starts preaching, if you can imagine this. I love, I'm just somebody who loves just seeing it. And he gets up to there and he knows the people of Israel, these are Israelites, people who are called by God, for God, they're his people. And he gets up and he's telling them, how long, you Christians, you believers in the Most High God, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord Jesus Christ is your God, then follow him. But if Baal is your God, if you, yourself, worshiping yourself, the false gods, the idols that we make on a daily basis, is your God, then follow him. Imagine that. Imagine that. That somebody gets up and just challenges you like that to your face. And this is amazing what happens next. But the people said nothing. No response. None. Nothing happened. No response. No nothing. The people said nothing. Can you imagine that, church? That when the man of God gets up and says, Hey, church, we need to serve God. We need to love God. We need to give everything to God. The church is quiet. How many of us want to take a stand for God? Not a word comes up. How many of us know that we need to change our lives for the glory of God? Not a word, not a response. Have we truly come to that time, church? Have we truly come to that? To where we don't want to take a stand for God anymore? We'd rather remain silent. Pastor, just leave us alone. Please don't try to get in our business. Please don't try to correct us. Please. The Bible says, and in those times people will go around looking for words that will tickle, tickle their ears. Those words that are going to just be pleasing to them, but not really having any change in here. It's going to happen. It's called the falling away of the saints. And God help us, church, that every single one of us in this room here this morning will learn how to guard their heart. 
That you learn how to guard it with the word of God. That you don't fall for everything. Like the people of Israel. With the simple things that we do on a daily basis. With the things that we're just enticed into. Ahab should have taken that standard for the people of Israel. But he didn't. He allowed his wife to seduce him into Baal worship. Into worship of Asherah. And now all these prophets, almost 900 and 50, 850 of them are there. These are prophets, ministers of the enemy. When they should have been serving the one true God. In our lives here this morning, Victory Faith Church, do you worship the one true God? Do you worship the one true God? If you do, give him a hand of praise this morning, church. We cannot follow two masters. You just can't. You can't. The Bible is clear that you must love one and hate the other. You cannot love God and love this world. I've said this time and time again that this world has nothing, absolutely nothing to offer you. But yet, here we are time and time again, just wishy-washy, straddling the fence, lukewarm. But God says, if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And nobody wants to hear this anymore. Nobody wants to hear the message of living a life of holiness. Because it's offensive. But can I tell you this this morning, church? That God expects us to live a life of holiness. He still does. That's never going to change. Churches, pastors might accept another doctrine of saying, hey, we're not going to preach this word, or we're not going to preach that word, because it's offensive to people, and we might lose them. Listen to me. Listen. Please hear me. In this house, we will always preach the unadulterated yeah. word of God. Yeah. Always. And the moment we stop is the moment you need to go. Hear me, church. Because you don't worship me and you don't worship Pastor J.D. You worship the one true God. And if the day ever comes to where you hear a watered and down message, if the day ever comes to where we're not preaching the word of God anymore, then you, as a believer in God, need to stand up on your own two feet and say, hey, guess what? They're not going to preach the word of God. I'm going to go where they're preaching the word of God. Yes. Do we believe that church? Yes. I said, do we believe that church? Yes. It needs to be about him. It's always been about him. It will continue to be about him. If the Lord is your God, then follow him and tell others about him. But if he is not your God, then it's time to get out of the way. So let's go to verse 22 through 29. And we're talking about cutting the bull at this point. And it says, Then Elijah said to him, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. And this is where the challenge comes on the bulls. Get the two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it to pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set it on fire. I will prepare the other bull and put on the wood, but do not set fire to it. Then you call. Here's the challenge. Then you call the name of your God, of that idol that you're worshiping, and I will call on the name of the Most High God, on the Lord. Then the God who answers by fire, then he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. We'll have that challenge with you, Elijah. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal. From morning till noon, Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. 
At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought. Maybe your god is busy. Maybe your god is traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. And maybe he needs to be awakened. And so they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time came for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. Again, no response. No one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired. Look at this. He repaired. Everybody say that. Say, he repaired. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. That's amazing to me, church. Listen to me. That we could call upon all these different gods and all these different idols, but when the time comes, they're not going to answer you. They have ears, but they can't hear you. They have eyes, but they can't see you. They do not know you like our God knows you. You might be saying this morning, Pastor John, the one true God knows me. You better believe it. He knows you. It says that even before you were created in your mother's womb, he already knew you and he called you by name. He loves you. He has a plan for your life. Unlike the enemy, the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come to give you life and life in abundance. Can we give God a hand of praise for that this morning, church? Life and life in abundance. And go back to verse 29 real quick. And it says that there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Listen to me this morning. The God of this world will lie to you and give you your worldly desires, but when it comes down to your true out of need, He will not answer you. On the flip side, the one true God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The one true God says that when you go through the fires, you will not be burned. The one true God says that when you go through those waters, you will not drown. The one true God says that I will make every crooked way straight. He says that I, I am your God and I change not. He says I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he has a plan for each and every single one of us in this house this morning. Do we believe that? I said do we believe that church? God is a good God. I said God is a good God. Can we just praise him right now church? That he's a good God. Can we thank him for the great things that he has done in our lives? He is the one true living God. And it's amazing to me that when all these other little gods, little G's, are put up against the one true God, they never stand a chance. They can't. Because there is no God like Jehovah. I said there is no God like Jehovah Church. There's not. There's not. Come on, praise him this morning if you're going to praise him. Let's finish this. In verse 30 to 33, and we're going to jump over to 37. Verse 30 says, Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took, look at this, 12 stones, one of each of them from the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord have come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two shares of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull. Look at that. Everybody say, cut the bull. Say, cut the bull. <laughs> okay, so you guys can look at me saying, no, Pastor John was cussy. I wasn't. It's right there. Do you see it? Everybody see it? Oh, come on. Only one person. Who sees it up there? Yeah. Amen. Okay, there it is. It says cut the bull. Cut the bull into pieces and he laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. 
Con Tarzán. And it says, Answer me. And this is Elijah. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you are the Lord. That you are God. And that you are turning their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the wood, the stones, the soil, and it also licked up the water that was inside that trench. When all the people saw this, they bowed down and they cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Yeah. Let's give God a hand of praise this morning for that. Amen. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized them, Elijah had them brought down to the valley, and they were all slaughtered there. We're going to stop there. In our lives, church, in our lives, please hear me, please focus on me right now. Not on your friend, not on the person next to you, not on your phones, nothing. I need you to focus on this. They allowed sin they allowed idols to take the place of God in their lives. Have we done that? Have we truly just hurt the heart of God? Toward where God used to live, we put alcohol, or we put sex, or we put sin in general, or we put our pride, or our job, our careers, our attitudes, our characteristics, all these things, I could go on all day long. Have we taken God off the altar of our heart, like the people of Israel, and replaced it with some simple bell God? Have we? It's time, church, listen to me. It's time to repair those altars. It's time to go back and say, you know what, God? I need to put you back up on that altar. I need to put you where you truly belong, God, so I can worship you and only you. I don't want to worship these Baal gods any longer. I don't want to worship the, the world any longer. I just need to worship you. To focus on you. To love you. To know you. To trust you. To put my faith in you, God. It has to be about God. We need a sacrifice in order to see a great move of God in our lives again, church. We truly do. We need to sacrifice our own fleshly desires. We need to let go of those things that are holding us back. What's holding you back this morning? What's holding you back from giving it all to God? Every single person in this room should be able to answer that question. Because you know it. You're already thinking about it right now. That this is holding you back. I've allowed this thing to take the place. I've allowed this thing to take priority in my life. I've allowed this thing to take too much of my time, my energy. I've allowed it. And it's time to put God on number one again. It's time to rebuild that altar. And God says this morning that he will be with you. That he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to hold you with his righteous right hand. He's going to hold you say, it's okay. It's okay, I know you're afraid. But it's time to get back up. I know this looks so scary for you, but it's okay. I'm your dog. I'm your friend. I can help you. And if we would allow God to do that, church. Number one, we need to come here to God. Number two, we need to choose today whom we will serve. If the Lord is our God, then we need to follow Him. We need to repair the altar of God in our life once again. We need to sacrifice our old self and let Him make us a true new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Number three, we need to cut the bull. Stop making excuses. We need to stop putting idols in the place where God belongs. We need to take a stand for God 
and take a stand and let those things that are taking the place of God fall today. And hear me, when we do those things, church, we will truly see the fire of God fall in our lives once again. How many want the fire of God to fall in your life? I said, how many want the fire of God to fall in your life? It takes you sacrificing that flesh. It hurts sometimes. Yes, it does. Your own fleshly desires, your own messed up ways. Don't be blaming the enemy for everything that comes out of this heart. And we need to be responsible for that. Because out of what the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So as we read our words and as we pray, as we spend time with God, guess what? Guess what? God will let the fire fall upon your life once again. His blessings. His favor, church. He wants to do that this morning. I'm going to ask you all to stand. To stand, you know, this, this one. Just stand. With every eye closed. Every eye closed all over this house. It's time to take a stand for God. It's time to say, God, I need to serve you. I want to serve you. No more about tomorrow. Today. Today we need to choose whom we will serve. We can't be saying yes to this world and yes to God any longer. Again, that's been on my heart for the past month. Is choose today whom you're going to serve. If you're going to serve the one true God, then serve Him. But if you want to serve the world and the enemy, hey, then serve Him. It's a choice we all have to make. And the scripture is clear. If the Lord is God, then follow Him. But if Baal is God and it's your God, then follow Him. It's unfortunate. It's, a, it's sad. If we would ever choose something else over the one true God. Because the one true God loves you. The one true God has a plan for your life. The one true God wants to bless your life and life in abundance. The one true God has made a way for you to spend eternity with Him in heaven and that's through Jesus Christ, His Son. And what you need to do today is believe on His Son. Believe Jesus Christ is the one and only way to heaven. And if you can do that and confess Him as Lord, that's all it takes. Living for Him. Sacrificing your fleshly ways. Sacrificing your fleshly desires. Letting go of everything that the world has to offer you. And saying yes to God. I know. Please hear me this morning. I know. You might be saying, Pastor John, that's a lot. That's a lot to give up. But can I tell you this? That God gave up a lot as well. He gave up a lot when he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to this world to die for us. To die for me, to die for you. He gave up so much more. And all you have to do is surrender. All you have to do is lay it at the foot of the cross. Say, do what? God, I'm messed up. I'm a messed up person right now. And I need change. I need you, God. I need to be different. And when we say those words, God is just coming and just beginning to change and begin to fill you with this love that you've never experienced in your life. But it's a choice. It's a choice. Choose today whom you will serve. So this morning, this morning, church, how many of you with just a show of hands saying I need to get back on track with God just lift that hand if that's you if that's you just lift that hand say pastor I need to get back on track with God come on don't be ashamed don't be ashamed don't I need to get back on track with God lift that hand lift that hand how many of you need change and you want God to do the change you want God to be that change Keep that hand lifted. I'm going to ask you to be ready with me this morning. I'm already up here and I'm standing here. 
So if that's you lifting that hand, I'm going to ask you to join me at this altar. Just come, please, just come. Come right now, just come. Just come. Make your way to this altar, come on. Just come. If that was you on the, on the balcony as well, then you come down, I'll wait. We don't do this trying to force it on anybody. This is just a point. I'm saying, God, I'm surrendering. I'm allowing you to do what you need to do in my life. And I'm letting the world know, letting everyone know that I want to serve God. I want everyone to see it, to know it, that I want change, that I need change, that I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Please come closer. Come closer to this altar. This morning, God wants to touch your life. He wants to touch you right where you're at. All you have to do is that. So I'm going to ask you, just lift those hands right where you're at. Just lift them. Lift them right all this room. Just lift them. Just lift them. And this morning, this morning, tell him, I surrender all, God. Tell him, I surrender all. Tell him, God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Tell him right now, say, God, forgive me for sinning against you. God, forgive me for worshiping other things when I should have been worshiping you. God, I need to get back on track with you. I need you, God, to touch my heart. I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. You are my God. And I am your child. Tell him, I thank you, God, for dying for me on that cross. And I believe. Tell him, I believe that you are the Son of God. Tell him, I believe that you are my healer. I believe. Today, I believe. And I put my trust in you to help me to get me through life's pains, life's trials, life's troubles. I'm yours, God. Tell them I'm yours. Thank you, God. Now, thank you for dying on that cross for someone like me. And God, I know. Come, come on. Say, God, I know. That beyond a shadow of a doubt, that right now, I am saved. I am born again. I love you, God. And thank you. Tell them, thank you for loving me. I give you everything, God. I give you everything, God. In Jesus' my name, I pray. Amen. Now can we as a church give them a big high clap? Come on, come on. This morning, just a couple more moments and then we're going to be dismissed. If we could just sing this song, that I believe He is my healer. We're going to sing that this morning. With every eye closed, I'm, we're just going to focus on God, worshiping God. I'm God, that's it. That's it. Come on, let's just worship Him. Lift our hands all over the room. Come on.
that we need. Amen. May God bless you all. May you have a blessed week. Service today at 4 o'clock as well.